Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam as we greet you uh, with assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and with Ramadan Kareem for it is today the ninth day of the blessed month of Ramadan but for those listen carefully to my words listen carefully because this is what the angels will be looking for for those of you who had the evidence that the month had commenced for for those of you who had the evidence that the month had commenced earlier well this is your tenth day did you hear me carefully for those of you who had the evidence and evidence cannot be a sheet of paper <laughs> no. evidence cannot be a telephone call <laughs> evidence no that's not the evidence uh, that's not our subject today, but uh, we on this day we have the Jews to recite of a, uh, do you remember it is Surah to Yusuf and Surah to Rad hmm? uh, on the ninth day of the month. Now then, um, uh, we have some good news for Pakistan, oh yes, <laughs> uh, and that is that uh, we have a uh, a promise of all the funds we need uh, to publish in Pakistan 1,000 copies of all my books, including my teacher's uh, great work, the Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society. Uh, and at this time, we're sim simply trying to find a print tree, uh, perhaps a print tree in Lahore. And then the printing work will commence and it probably will take only two or three weeks, so we might be able to have the books printed in time for Eid will fit it. Those of you who who did not have the means to buy a set of books and you requested a free set of books, uh, we now no longer will be sending the books to you from Malaysia. And so we save ourselves the expensive email charges, uh, sorry, email charges. So if you are in Pakistan, you'll be able to get your books in Pakistan. You simply have to pay the local charge. And uh, in similarly, I hope you'll be able to have the books printed yeah, in India, and you'll be able to get the books in India, uh, those of you who are buying the books, at a price that people can afford. And those who cannot afford, and we have pledged to give you a free set, uh, you won't have to pay the expensive uh, MA charges, nor do you have to face Indian customs, <laughs> who might detain your books. Uh, and you'll be able to get the books in India. Similarly with uh, Bangladesh, mashallah, I uh, have a very large team of volunteers in Bangladesh and they're already working. And uh, yes, Pakistan, we are, I am convinced that the Institute of Islamic Eschatology should be established in Pakistan, yes. Although there are voices which are, which are, which are expressing concern and so on. No, 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 I don't care. The Institute, inshallah, if Allah so is kind to bless this, this project with success, the Institute will be established in Pakistan. That's where I studied Islam. That's where I got my knowledge. That's right. That's where I went to university for the first time. Um, and I lived in Pakistan so, for so many years. Yes. Uh, so I have to return something to the people of Pakistan, um, inshallah. So the institute will be established in Pakistan. Hey, don't don't apply for admission yet, uh, please, <laughs> please give me some time. Okay, we have to we have to get a team of special specially selected people uh, as a committee to begin the, the project. Then we need a lot of volunteers to support us. We need land. We need money and so on. I will need scholars who can assist me. And uh, I don't know how long it will take. But wait, please wait until you hear the announcement. You see the announcement that the project is starting. And at that time, you could apply for admission because people are already writing to me. 
to get admission to the institute. That's right. <laughs> so, well, mashallah, this is a good sign. This is a good, good sign, yes, that so many people are convinced that this branch of knowledge uh, is very important and we should study it. My institute is not going to replace the Darul Loom, not at all. My institute cannot teach all the subjects which are being taught in the Darul Loom. But I hope that the graduates of the Darul Loom will come to us so we can continue the education for them, particularly in methodology for the study of the Quran and the Hadith, and also for introducing them to Ilmu Akhiru Zaman. So this institute is not a threat to the Darul it's, It will complement and help so that the product that comes out of the Darul Loom will be refined into something far superior than what now obtains. Now then, we return now to teaching Islamic eschatology, and we began with the visit of the angel Gabriel, Jibra'il alayhi salam, uh, which was a memorable event. It's unforgettable, and yet we forgot it. <laughs> And uh, it was meant Allah's wisdom. Allah's wisdom was to get this event to impact, impact on the consciousness of the Ummah forever and ever. Because there was something extremely important which was delivered by divine decree in this event. And that was the importance of Islamic eschatology because that was question four and question five. And it was also methodology for the study of Islamic eschatology, which is number one, two, and three. And also, which we now return to, the difference between number four, uh, uh, the difference between the two signs given in number five. Now then, methodology. We return to methodology for the study of Ilmu Akhirul Zaman. We've already done the movement from Islam to Iman to Ihsan. And Ihsan is to be able to worship Allah as though you're seeing Him with your heart. And so there is externally acquired knowledge and there is internally received knowledge. And no one, to my knowledge, no one, has done a better defense, a better defense of the validity of knowledge internally received than Dr. Muhammad Iqbal. And it is to be found in the first two chapters of his book, The Reconstruction of Religious Thought in Islam. The problem we have is that out of every 1,000 people who have studied Iqbal, 999 have studied him in Urdu and in Farsi. And probably one in a thousand has any, even a passing acquaintance of what Dr. Iqbal has delivered in the English language. Only one in a thousand. That is the major problem we face with Iqbal and the Iqbalians. Huh? So this is perhaps the best defense ever written of the validity of knowledge internally received. The first two chapters of Iqbal's reconstruction of religious thought in Islam. May I suggest, do you mind, that you try to find that book and read those two chapters? Well, when I was a student, uh, doing my master's degree in philosophy and uh, I was already 20, 26, 27 years of age at that time. I read those two chapters about 20 times to be able to try to understand them. <laughs> okay. And it was only when I studied Surah al Kaf of the Quran only then did I understand fully what Iqbal was saying in those two chapters. So don't be disheartened if you cannot understand him at the beginning. Time, inshallah, will allow you to mature as a thinker. And now we go now to the question number five. 
what are the signs of the last day? You know, they say, they always, always say, only Allah knows the future, only Allah knows the future. But in addition to that, yes, only Allah knows the future. But there are certain things called alama to sah, signs of the last day that Allah, from his knowledge, has communicated this to Nabi Muhammad And he has communicated this knowledge to him that it should reach us. And when it reaches us, we have to act on the basis of this knowledge because it is supremely important. That's why you had that memorable, unforgettable event, okay? And so the signs of the last day is important. And he said, he gave two signs. Number one, he said that you'll find the naked barefooted shepherds competing with each other in construction of high-rise buildings. Who can build the tallest one of all? Indicating that an age is going to come when people who have no worth, essentially no worth, they're just like naked barefooted shepherds. They don't have any worth in terms of knowledge, in terms of experience, uh, 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 insight, nothing of these things. And these people will suddenly get wealth and now the world will judge someone not on the basis of his knowledge, not on the basis of his character, not on the basis of his personality, but on the basis of how much wealth he has. That is the lesson being said. And so those who belong to the Jamaat of Summun, Bukmun, Umyun, the deaf, the dumb, and the blind, that's how they'll judge people. He has money, so he is high. And he has none, so he's a nobody. And that's the warning. But you already understand that. This is a sign which is plain and clear, easily understood. No need for any ta'wil or interpretation. And so the Prophet والسلام, is communicating to us this information pertaining to methodology. And that is that there will be many signs in Akhirul Zaman, many signs of the last day, which will be like this. They will be plain and clear, and anyone will be able to understand them. You don't need any insight, you don't need any interpretation to penetrate them. Therefore, they are ayat muhkamat, like the verses of the Quran which are ayat muhkamat. But now comes the second one. And talid al-amatu rabbataha, which I have already explained to you on the last session. And here is a sign that a slave woman would give birth to her mistress. This is not plain. This is not clear. And this is not to be understood literally. You have to go and penetrate the subject. You have to find out what is it that produces this slave woman? What is it that brings slavery once more into the world in Akhirul Zaman? And how can a slave woman give birth to someone who will rule over her? Hmm? This, is, this is the meat of the subject. And therefore you need insight and you need interpretation to wheel and that is the heart of methodology for the study of ilmu akhiru zaman and that is what is manifestly missing in the darul education they don't touch this at all at all and our salafi brothers even reject this they say oh no no only the early Muslims, the Aslaf and the Nabi alayhi salatu only they are entitled 
to interpret. No one else can interpret. That is Salafi Islam. Unfortunately, when you adopt that kind of methodology, the world leaves you and you left behind sitting on a sofa. <laughs> yes. And so now today, we want to proceed to, to further elaborate on the, the subject of methodology for the study of Ilmo Akhirism. And we are now fully, fully immersed in a branch of knowledge called epistemology. Listen to the word epistemology, the study of knowledge. What are the sources of knowledge? What are the kinds of knowledge? How do you validate knowledge and so on? And now we turn to proceed further to the next step. We turn to, I don't need to explain to a Muslim audience, I don't need to explain that Nabi Isa Islam would return. But to a non-Muslim audience and to the Ahmadiyya who have rejected this and they are woefully misguided and the problem with the Ahmadiyya, at least not all, some, most of them, is you can't talk to them. They are so brainwashed. They have lost the capacity to think. That is brainwashing. Mm -hmm. So they reject the view, the belief that Nabi Isa Islam would return. Mm -hmm. And once you reject that belief, forget it, you do not have an eschatology. You cannot understand Akhir Zaman. You are woefully misguided. So now then, we don't have to return to that subject, on the subject of the return of Jesus al Islam, because our people already know that. Uh, but our, 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 our Prophet al Islam told us that before Nabi Isa al Islam returns, that Allah will release someone into the world who would seek to impersonate Nabi Isa al Islam. And since he, Nabi Isa al Islam, is the Messiah, and the Messiah, according to the Prophet, Islam, is one who would be Hakim, who would rule. Hakim means rule. Not rule downtown Chicago, ruling the whole world. Hmm? And when we say someone rules the world, we imply by that that there is no rival to his rule. That is ruling the world. There is no rival to the rule. It doesn't mean that you have to establish your rule in every square inch of downtown Chicago. Very good. And so now we are introduced to Al-Masih al-Dajjal, who is going to seek to impersonate Nabi Isa al-Islam. I would suggest that you read my book, the Quran, the Jal, and the Jasad, in order to be able to get from the Quran an introduction to the Jal. But we don't have the time for that today. That's not our subject for today. Um, but our Prophet said about the Jal uh, that he would be released into the world and he would eventually rule the world from Jerusalem, he would proclaim himself to be Al-Masih, Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And he cannot proclaim himself to be the Messiah and get the Jews to accept that his, his claim is correct unless he's ruling the world. Hmm? That's the implication. And ruling the world from a state of Israel. Hmm. And so when you see the Jews being brought back to Jerusalem and to the Holy Land after 2,000 years of exile. And your response is to eat your biryani and go home and sleep. What kind of a scholar are you? And when you see that the state of Israel is restored in the Holy Land, and it makes the claim that it is the holy Israel of Nabi Dawood and Nabi Suleiman alayhi 
And your response to that is to eat your biryani and go home and sleep. What kind of scholarship is that? And now it is plain and clear. The Prime Minister of Israel declared, we control the United States of America. Anybody else had said that, the U.S. would declare war, the Marines would land. But the Prime Minister of Israel says that, and no one's even squeak in the United States <laughs> indicating it's true. And if the United States is the ruling state in the world, and that is the state of, of Israel, you can recognize that Israel is well on its way, well on its way to ruling the world. The present lockdown, for example, the present lockdown around the world, which is unique, is a startling evidence that the Dajjal already, already is, has established a significant rule over the whole world. This is startling evidence, dazzling evidence. Now then, it's necessary for us, since we know the Malham is around the corner, the Malham being Abaganat, and we know of the prophecy of Nabi Muhammad that the next event after the Malhama is the conquest of Constantinople. So those who declare that the conquest of Constantinople, which occurred, occurred long years ago, you can tell them, go back to the museum and live in the museum. You don't belong to our people, the Jamaat of people who think. Huh? Go back to the museum, please. <laughs> the conquest of Constantinople will take place shortly after the Malhama. And I have news for you. I am of the opinion that most of North Africa are going to be in that army that will conquer Constantinople. There'll be lots from Algeria. Oh, yes, from Mauritania. There'll be those from Morocco and Tunisia. There'll be Egyptians and Libyans. Oh, yes, I, I believe there'll be more people from North Africa than from the heart of the Arab world. And uh, there'll be Kurdish Muslims. Oh, yes, lots of Kurds will be in that army. And they will fight to liberate Constantinople. Why? Do you remember? so we can return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world. And when Hagia Sophia, the Cathedral of Hagia Sophia, is returned to the Christian world, and we offer an apology for what was done, that this changing of the status of the cathedral to make it a masjid was something, listen to my words, because I choose my words carefully and Turkey and the Balkans will not stop me. It was shameful what Musultan Muhammad Fatih did in transforming that Christian cathedral into a masjid. It was shameful. It was disgraceful. It was manifestly sinful. And our Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, has Praise that army and praise the commander who will conquer Constantinople. Why? Because we will return Hagia Sophia to the Orthodox Christian world. We will apologize to the Christian world for what was done. And when that happens, no one can stop the alliance of the Ummah of Muhammad with the Ummah of Nabi Isa Islam. And if you do not like my words, go take a holiday. Go take a holiday. You're not going to be, have me as your little um, gramophone record repeating what you want to say, not at all. This will, did you hear me? Whether you like it or you don't, when Hagia Sophia is returned, listen to me. You can't stop me. You can't tell me what to say. When Hagia Sophia is returned, this will cement the friendship and alliance between the Ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam and the Ummah, the Ummah, the Ummah of Nabi Isa alayhi salam. You don't like that? Go home and sleep.
Those are my words. Now then, we are told that it is after the conquest of Constantinople that the Dajjal will appear, the Khuruj of the Dajjal will take place. And so it is in the essence of Islamic eschatology that we must pay careful attention to what our Prophet said about the Dajjal. Not only did he say that he would be a Jew, not only did he say that he would be a young man, and that he would be powerfully built, and that he would have the curls, the sides, I think they call sideburns, that the Orthodox Jews still have, because it's there in the Torah, in order to keep it like that. But here comes the crucially important event uh, uh, in the study of the Jal, the false messiah. Listen carefully. And uh, my Christian, there are lots of Christians who are listening to me now. There are even Hindus who are listening to me because they're interested in the subject. I'm sure there are Jews who are also listening. And I'm not hostile to the Jewish faith. I don't speak insultingly about the Jewish faith, but I will never bow and submit to an oppressor. And I ask my Jewish brothers who are like that, do not support this oppressor state of Israel, not at all. Now then, this is what our prophet said. I won't take much time again today. He said about the Dajjal, would you please put on your thinking caps? He said, every prophet has warned his people about the Dajjal. And the prophet knew that is Noah. Nur alayhi salam. He warned his people about the Dajjal. And so this is a subject which has been taught all through history. There must be evidence and knowledge about the Dajjal with the Hindus. We have to help the Hindu to locate it in his scriptures. There has to be the even knowledge about the Dajjal in the Torah and in the Gospel and in the Buddhist scriptures. It must be there. But our Islamic scholarship, we have to reach out to help them to locate what they have about the Dajjal and that will then be a benefit to us as well. So this is what he said. And the Prophet Noah, alayhi salam, the Prophet Noah, he also warned his people about the Dajjal, but I, this is Nabi Muhammad speaking, I am going to tell you something about the Dajjal which no one has said before me. So Allah saved the best for the last. Or oh, perhaps he saved that which was most crucially important Important of all, he saved it for the last prophet. What is it? I'm going to tell you something no one ever said before me. He said, the jar sees with one eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grip. But your Lord, Allah, is not one-eyed. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word disbeliever, kafir. And every mu'min, meaning someone who has faith, and we Muslims, we don't have a monopoly on faith, okay? There's faith outside of our community as well. And every mu'min, whoever has faith, would be able to read the word Dajjal, whether he is kertib, that is literate, or ghayru kertib, that is illiterate, whether he can read and write or whether he cannot read and write, he still be able to read the word kafir. Here is our introduction to epistemology. 
and to those first two chapters of Iqbal's book. Mm -hmm. When you are confronted with this data, this information, you have to decide, is this an ayah muhkama or is it an ayah mutashabiha? Is it like the barefooted shepherds and the tall, tall buildings? Or is it like the slave woman giving birth to her mistress needs interpretation? And the answer is, if you consider this to be plain and clear, then when Dajjal appears in Jerusalem, I may not live to see it, but you may live to see it. And he declares that I am the Messiah. And you look on his face and you see that he has two eyes. He's seeing with two eyes. Guess what you do? Shall I tell you? <laughs> you say, no, no, no. He can't be Dajjal because he's seeing with two eyes. And the prophet said, Dajjal sees with one eye. That is the problem we have with your bogus methodology. Yes, you are schoolboys. Your schoolboys with this methodology of yours. Even young people now listening to me can understand that this is not, this is not Aya Mukhkama. This is Aya Mutashabiha. That when the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that the Dajjal sees with the left eye, the left eye symbolizes external sight. Did you hear? And when he said that he is blind in the right eye, the right eye symbolizes, the blind, the right eye symbolizes that he is internally blind. And all those who followed the Jal would also be internally blind. We're seeing a lot of people following the jar in this lockdown. I don't want to get them embarrassed, and I don't want to pick a fight with them. But my listening audience there could be able to see the inside, you know, who are those who are following the jar? It's so funny, who are following the jar in this lockdown, okay? Let's not pursue the subject any further. And so the great danger that comes from Dajjal is epistemological. That he not only is internally blind, but he seeks to reduce all of mankind to internal blindness. And that road is called today the road of secularism, the secular state, the secularization of knowledge. Yeah? You go to university, and never, ever, ever in the university are you taught, except in the Department of Religion, <laughs> about angels, about the last day, about Allah. No, no, no. Take this out of the curriculum. <laughs> you are studying knowledge here, and that does not qualify as knowledge. That is secular education. And so we have legions of people now over these last 100 years who are the products of a secular educational system and who are now just like Dajjal. They are internally blind. That is the danger. That is the danger. And if you want to study Islamic eschatology, you cannot do it unless and until you see with two eyes. Two eyes. Hmm? Now on his forehead is written the word kafir indicating that he is the leader who leads people to kufr, to, make, to destroy your faith. That's his mission, because it's written on his forehead. It's not that you have to get turn on the lights, let's see his forehead. Oh, no, no, I'm not seeing anything written on his forehead. He cannot be the judge. <laughs> That's what those people with the... With the <laughs> the wrong, the bogus methodology, when he stands up in Jerusalem, they say, no, he can't be Dajjal. Why? The man is seeing with two eyes. He can't be Dajjal. Why? Look, nothing written on his forehead. 
another on the side. This is what we have a scholarship today. If you are belonging to that Jamaat and you listen to me, I hope you'll wake up. I hope you'll wake up. The, the word cafe written on the forehead is not to be understood literally. The word cafe written on the forehead is that he is going to lead you to kufr. There is kufr today. Kufr means disbelief, the destruction of belief. There is kufr today in the political system. There is kufr today in the economic system, in the market, in the monetary system. There is kufr today in the educational system. There is kufr today in the feminist revolution. Kufr is all around us today. And today, from the time you follow the judge, you're following him to the road of kufr, and that's going to take you into the hellfire. And now finally, before we end, how is it that the mu'min who has faith and faith resides in the heart, and you can't faith in the supermarket. No. He will be able to read carefully whether he is literate or illiterate. How come? So we send uh, Abu Jahal, the kafir, we send him to the eye specialist. Check out his eyes. How come he cannot read? Kafir. How come? Uh, uh, the word Kafir is written on the forehead, but he cannot read it. And uh, anyone who has faith can read it. So we send him to the eye specialist. And the report comes back from the eye specialist. Oh, nothing, nothing wrong with him. He got perfect vision. He got 20 20 vision. So then the question arises. Why is it that he cannot read and he can read? Did you hear the question? Why is it that he cannot read but he can read? And to answer that question, we have to ask the question that you already heard before. Do we have any other eyes besides these eyes? He says no, because he, he studied at Oxford and Cambridge and just so and Harvard and Yale. He said, no, 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 no. These are the only eyes we have. But this one says yes. This one says yes. Because the Quran says yes. Allah says in Surah Al-Hajj, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Will they not travel to the earth? Perchance that by traveling, the dead heart might come alive. فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبُ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا and when the dead heart comes alive, they'll be able to use that heart to pursue knowledge, to acquire knowledge. It's not just the brain, the rational faculty, the heart is also there. But with the heart, you'll be able to understand what otherwise could not be understood. And now you'll be able to hear what otherwise could not be heard. For in the heart, no, 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 no. It's not these eyes which are blind, says Allah. No. What I can tell you about the deepest salute. What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest. And Allah gives another warning. And with this we then put it. He says, I can't remember now which surah, uh, but if you find it, you can put it for me in the comment section of YouTube channel. He says, Man kana fi hazihi a'ma. Whosoever is blind over here, in this world, in this life. For who will feel akhirati a'ma. You'll be blind in the next world as well. For adullah sabeel. And even more misguided. May Allah you and I, and all of us who are reciting the Quran from cover to cover this blessed Ramadan, may Allah protect us from that faith of being blind in this life and blind in the next. Thank you for Salaamu Alaikum.